Hello, uh, this is a video about the raw image files that we collect at the B21 SACS beamline at Diamond Light Source um, and how you go from those raw image files to the radially averaged and integrated DAT files that we're used to using. Um, so I'm going to quickly have a look at the structure of the experiment directory um, point out some of the files in it, uh, and then I'm going to look at the Dawn software package, which is a software package for data reduction and analysis that's really been developed uh, in-house at Diamond, um, and how you would use Dawn to visualize the raw images, and also how you would use Dawn to reduce the, the raw images to DAT files. Okay, so first of all, the experiment directory. So this is your top level experiment and inside here there's a whole bunch of files. You'll see uh, these files, the .nexus and .h5 files. They have a code name b21- hyphen and then some kind of incrementing integer um, that will repeat throughout your experiment 57, 58, 59, 60 etc through the experiment. Um, you don't really need to worry too much about what all these images are, uh, these files are. Uh, .nexus, uh, the nexus file format is a binary XML format that is kind of a standard for, that's been created for containing scientific information and metadata. Um, so it, it's got lots of information uh, under sort of headings like a dictionary, um, you know, with all the stuff that you need to know uh, about what the images are and how to go about interpreting the images. And then these H5 files um, are the, the actual raw data. So, so it's a stack of TIFF images um, with some header information. And then uh, Don has this concept of kind of dimensionality in the data, which means, you know, on our beamline, we would just tend to collect images over time, so image 1, image 2, image 3, image 4. So that um, uh, sort of index would be one dimension uh, and then you're, you've got your detector and it has two dimensions, the x and the y coordinates and then your intensity data on top of that. Um, other beamlines would do kind of mapping type experiments where they're maybe moving a couple of motors and mapping out some kind of you know two or three dimensional space uh, collecting data. So Don uh, looks at things in terms of that uh, dimensionality. Um, the, 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 the reason that there's three H5 files here, uh, one of them contains the raw data, the stack of TIFF images. Um, one of them just remaps that information so that it's convenient for Don to, to process. By remapping, I just mean it changes the, the sort of order of how the things are, are you know, the different dimensions. Um, the, I think the metadata is output by the detector and it's just lots of uh, information about what the detector is actually doing. Okay, so um, if you want to know what are these images, uh, there's a file here called scan list. You could open that in Excel or just a, um, like a text editor uh, would be fine. And you'll see that it link, it's got lots of lines in it and the lines link the code name to the descriptive title that you would have entered into the software. So then you could look up and you could see, ah, oh, yeah, this is my, you know, BSA sample or, or, or whatever. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about the other folders. Uh, processed is um, where the, as the images are collected, they're automatically reduced at the beamline using Dawn to DAP files and Don will be writing the DAT files into this processed directory. Um, so that's what's going on in the background. Um, HPLC has your sort of UV viz HPLC traces and stuff in it. Um, you don't have write access at the beamline in, in our file system to the top level directory. So you couldn't rename or delete these 
H5 and Nexus files, you also don't have write access to the processed directory. So that means uh, you sort of keep the integrity of the data. Uh, we know what the files are and they're always going to be there. Um, you do have write access to this processing directory. Uh, so if you're doing any uh, data analysis or things at the beam line, you would typically be saving um, your, your kind of manual processing or modeling or whatever inside your processing directory. But if we look at that directory, you'll see also inside the directory, you have um, a calibration Nexus file, a mask file, and a processing pipeline file. And these are the three files that have been used to do the data reduction. So when we're going at the beam line from these raw image files into the DAT files in the process directory, it's used these three files. So that is all the information that you need to be able to go and redo that. Um, and there's some other files in here, but I'm not going to talk about those uh, at the moment. Okay, so uh, now I'm going to switch to Dawn and how to use Dawn. Okay, so if you go to this website, um, dawnsci.org, um, or if you just Google for, you know, Diamond Dawn software, uh, I'm guessing you'll find your way through to this. Um, so this is where you would go. Uh, you can download Dawn through here for different platforms. Uh, there's also lots of information. There's YouTube videos, uh, manuals, quite, you know, FAQs. Um, there's information about the H5 and Nexus file formats and what they contain, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, um, if you have any specific questions about how to use Dawn, this is a really good place to come. Uh, I'm really focusing on B21 and how we do things at B21, but anything broader than that, I would encourage you to have a look at the information on this website, uh, dawnsci.org. Okay, um, so you've downloaded Dawn from that website and you've installed it on your machine um, and now you've opened it okay so the way that dawn is structured is there are different views and the the various panes and information that you'll see will be specific to a given view at the moment we are in the processing view uh, if you just want to have a look at your image you might want to use a different view this little icon here uh, open perspective is going to open a different perspective and you can see there's lots of different things it's it's for all the beam lines at diamond and all the different techniques and things that we use so there's lots of information here um, I'll use the data viz view there's other ones that you know you could probably do it in data browsing or d explore etc uh, but I'm going to open the the data viz so so here I am um, I'm going to open my file, so file, open file, here's my experiment directory and I'm going to choose the Nexus file, not the H5 files but the Nexus file and open. Now you don't immediately see the image uh, because there's lots of information inside this Nexus file. Uh, the detector data is the one that has the, the images in it, but you can see there's lots of other information here. You've got this um, as the integrating beamstop diode and the data from that. Um, some of it would be image data, some of it would be sort of 2D plots, some of it is just a, a, you know, a single number and that kind of thing. Okay, So if I choose uh, this, um, my detector data, uh, I also need to say this is the file, you know, I might have multiple files open here, this is the file, and then we bring up the plot. Um, you can see down here the kind of dimensionality of it, that we've actually got three different dimensions. It's just the way that Don has structured the, the thing. Um, I guess these last two are the X and Y dimensions of the detector. Okay, And you can actually re-map in here and look at different dimensions and that kind of thing. Okay, So at the moment, the, the screen looks black. The reason is it's kind of automatically histogrammed or scaled the intensity data so that you can see everything. Um, you'll see that uh, there's domain boundaries. That's this kind of vertical line and then these horizontal lines. Uh, there's domain boundaries. And then all these little flecks and spots and things are dead pixels in the detector. Um, and what you can see is uh, here, 
most of the image is kind of ones and twos and zeros. When we get into the domain boundary, you see we've got this massive number. So that's the reason that you're just seeing black is because it's trying to display zero and you know four gazillion um, at on one image. So we uh, we can basically rescale the data so that we can actually see it. Um, so there's a couple of different ways of doing that. One way would be um, this little plus icon is a zoom thing. So if I click on this tool, okay, I could zoom in on a particular part of the detector. And then if I press the H key on my keyboard for histogram, it's going to re-histogram, rescale the image just for that little window. And because this little window doesn't contain any of those dead pixels or module boundaries, it's kind of scaled in an appropriate way. And then I can use this little button here, perform auto scale to open up the whole image. Okay, And now I can actually see what my image looks like. Um, this black little oval shape thing is the beam stop. Uh, there's a little carbon fiber arm coming up here and then behind it you can see there's this kind of white shine that's the intense beam close to the beam stop um, you can see if I go up here we've got you know sort of 400 counts and then as, as I move away the counts sort of drop off until we're down to this kind of background that's really going to go all the way to the edge of the detector um, so that's one way of doing it there's also in this little uh, tool drop down image tools you'll see there's a histogram option. Um, inside histogram, we can use this to rescale uh, the image in various ways. Uh, image settings, we can drop this down. Um, at the moment, it's set to log scale, which is probably not a bad idea. Um, we could do, you know, recolor the image so that it might be easier to see. There's also this um, square root scale. Um, Again, it just gives you a little bit more resolution and so you can kind of see what's going on. Okay, so if you wanted to open your images and have a look at them, uh, this data vis view is useful and you can use the tools that I've just showed you to uh, interrogate the image. Okay, so um, let's go to how you would process the information. Uh, I'm going to use the processing view. If you don't have it up here, use this and you should be able to find the processing view and open it. Okay, um, and that brings us through to here. Okay, um, I've already got the image open here. I'm just going to close that so that we can start from scratch. So what we've got is here are the images that we're going to process in this data slice view. Um, we've got a processing pipeline, and I'll go through that in a minute. Uh, each step in the processing pipeline has some settings and things associated with it. And then we've got a view here of what the output of a given step is going to be. So the first thing to do would be to open up your processing pipeline. So there's a um, load configured pipeline icon here just above the processing little pane. Um, we navigate to our experiment directory in the processing subdirectory and then we've got here is our processing pipeline. So open up that. Um, this is the file that we're going to open. OK. And it's opened up that processing pipeline here. OK. Now, there's a couple of steps here that refer to explicit files. The first one is import detector calibration. So if I click on that, you'll see over here it's loading a calibration file and that has been in that processing pipeline it has been hard coded to the directory structure that it would have been if you were at diamond okay but uh, that's no longer going to be where the data is because you've downloaded it and you have it installed or um, saved onto your your computer at home so we're going to have to redirect this so again um, this is my experiment directory here uh, inside the processing subdirectory I have my calibration file so I'm going to open this okay so now I've got it pointed to where it actually is so that's the first step the next thing is import mask from file again this is hard coded to where it was at the beamline you're going to have to change this again in your processing subdirectory 
the mask file open. Um, so that's, you're pretty much finished. The last thing is export to text file. Um, you'll see again the output directory here has been hard-coded to where you were going to output it at the beam line, which is in the processed subdirectory. But you will probably want to change that. Um, what I normally do is inside my processing subdirectory, I'm going to create a new folder and call it something like manual processed. Um, and that way I know everything in here is stuff that I've manually reprocessed uh, using Dawn. You know, call it what you want, but that's not a bad way to do it. Okay, so I'm going to open that. So now I've pointed the output into that directory and all of the DAP files I'm now going to create are going to go into this directory. Okay, so let's load our image file. File, open file to process. Um, and I am again choosing my Nexus file open. You'll get a pop-up here that says what information do you want to get from the file and it's go you're going to want something like this. This is the, the detector data. You know, we don't want the beam stop intensity or anything like that. We want the detector data. Okay. Um, and you can see the sort of dimensions here. Uh, what this is, is there's the first dimension is just one, um, so not particularly useful. Then we've got 10 images in this particular Nexus file. Um, if you're doing the, the kind of robot biosec stuff, this will probably be something like 28 or you know whatever you set. Uh, HPLC, this will probably be more like sort of 600, 620, something like that. And then you've got your X and Y dimensions in your, your detector. Okay, so finish. Okay. Now, in the output view, we get the output from whichever step we're clicked on. So if I go into um, import mask from file, you'll see we will get, uh, again, this is our image file. Um, the green is all of the pixels that have been masked out. Uh, and you can see we've got rid of the, the beam stop and this little carbon fiber arm. We've got rid of all of the domain boundaries and we've got rid of all these dead pixels. Um, and you can see now that we can see the data, okay? Um, uh, so on, so basically we import the detector calibration. That is a file that has things like the camera length, the wavelength. Um, we set these up at the beam line by shooting a calibration standard. Um, set the error. Um, we count error as, if you look at all of the pixels within a Q-bin, what is the variation in the pixel intensity within the Q-bin, and we calculate an error from that. We get the mask from the file, that's these green masked out regions. Um, we set a threshold mask, that means um, any pixel above a certain threshold or below a certain threshold, we automatically get rid of. Um, so it just means if a new dead pixel arrives, we often will pick that up and get rid of it. Um, we divide by the beam stop intensity. Uh, and what that does is it just normalizes for uh, the kind of variation in the intensity. And the big error there is the top up cycle of the synchrotron storage ring. Um, and you'll see that the intensity data has a kind of a sawtooth pattern to it. And we just normalize for that so that um, the images scale together better. Um, Solid angle correction, uh, for a sax beam line, this is really minimal, but the way that the detector is working is there's a, a sort of phosphor layer on the front of the detector um, and it has a certain thickness. The thickness of the phosphor layer is going to be uh, related to how it, uh, efficient the detector is at, at measuring pixels, photons, a given pixel. Um, and as you go from the center of the detector towards, or you know, the beam center towards the edge of the detector, the angle that the photons are hitting that phosphor layer is changing. Um, the angle is getting steeper, uh, less normal as you go to the edge of the detector. And so the, the thickness of the phosphor, the apparent thickness of the phosphor changes, and that affects the efficiency of the detector. So we just correct for that. Um, because the detector is so far away in, a, in our sex experiments, it doesn't make a huge difference, but it's, it's a minor thing. Okay, so then we get to azimuthal integration. Um, so 
what the azimuthal integration does is um, it goes from the beam centre to the edge of the detector. Uh, there is an azimuthal range. Um, so that would be uh, let me just. Um, so we're going from the, the beam centre towards the edge of the detector. The azimuthal range is the wedge that we're measuring. So if you can imagine um, like a sort of a slice of pie coming out from the, the, the detector, that angle that the slice of pie is, um, is the azimuthal range. Uh, at the moment we've got nothing set for azimuthal range and that means it's just going to take the whole detector face. But you could change the azimuthal range. Um, uh, we also have the radial range, and that is going from the kind of Q min to Q max, but we could reduce that if you don't want it all the way to the edge of the plate or you want to reduce, uh, reject some pixels at low Q, you could restrict the, the radial range. Um, uh, and you can see that there's various other options in here uh, that, that you could set if you wanted to. Okay, um, uh, And so then we go through um, we multiply by a scalar. This number here is we normalize to water scatter so that the output is in absolute intensity units. So that would be reciprocal centimeters, photons uh, per second per reciprocal centimeter of detector face. Um, so we normalize so that it's in those absolute units and uh, this is the scale factor that we've arrived at by measuring water and then finally we're going to export uh, to text file okay so to process this um, we hit the play button um, it's saying where do you want to save things um, I want to save in my manual processed directory um, it's going to output the DAT files to the manual process directory because we put that into the export to text file. This is, it's also going to save another, a new Nexus file that has some information about how the file was processed. And I just want to put that in the same directory. So, OK. And here it goes. Doing its thing. This is doing it for the 10 images that are inside that Nexus file. And it's finished. So now if we have a look inside manual processed. You can see it's created a subdirectory and inside the subdirectory we've got 10 DAT files that it's, that it's output. Okay, so um, why would you want to do this reprocessing? You might want to do it if you've realized that uh, there's a dead pixel that you didn't mask out and so now you get a big spike here. Um, uh, you can redo the mask uh, I won't show you how to do that just now because it'll make this a very long video, but there'll be information about that inside the um, the Donsai website. If you're really interested in this, uh, just let me know and I'll do another video on how to do masking. Um, uh, the other reason might be, and this is the, the sort of important one, um, every now and again you're going to shoot a sample that the scattering is anisotropic. Um, so what that might mean is you're shooting a long filament like actin or a amyloid fibril or something like that and as the solution was flowing through the capillary those long fibers begin to align along the, di the direction of the capillary so that means you have the kind of long dimension in the horizontal so you're going to get uh, scattering to small angle in the horizontal um, smaller angle uh, and then in the vertical direction you've got the cross section of those fibers which is smaller and so you're going to get scattering to wider angles in the horizontal. So instead of getting this kind of round shaped scattering profile this is going to look sort of oval shaped where it will be taller than it is uh, wide. Okay. Now does that matter? Yes it does. What that means is if you now just take a radial average of the whole thing you're obviously averaging together uh, different scatter in different regions which is you know I guess you could argue that that is valid in some degree although bear in mind where you know it's going to be anisotropic in the the z direction so towards you and away from you and we've not taken that into account so it's kind of not a valid thing to do but anyway 
the big problem happens as we get to one of these uh, module boundaries. Okay, let's just say that it's scattering to wider angle in the vertical. As our Q bins that we're integrating cut through this module boundary, what it means is we're not getting this intense scattering signal from the vertical region, but we're still integrating from the horizontal. So what you'll see in your DAT file is as you get to the module boundary, you'll see the DAT files kind of decaying away in a nice smooth way, and then you get like a step, and now it's doing something different through the module boundary, and then it'll kind of clip back up. So you'll get these little sort of weird square depressions through your uh, signal. You often see it at the edge of the beam stop as well. You'll notice um, if you get strong scatter in the, the horizontal, you'll get, you know, it's all looking good until you get to the edge of the beam stop and then suddenly you'll get this kind of step function. So it's, it's at about sort of 0.02 in reciprocal angstroms, you'll get this kind of step um, and that's because you've got this kind of strong scatter. So Okay, so you might, under these circumstances, want to actually change the, the azimuthal range that you're integrating over. Uh, what I mean by that is uh, we've, we've established that from the beam center uh, in the horizontal direction, we have one kind of scattering, and then in the vertical direction, we have another kind of scattering. And so then you might want to choose an azimuthal range which uh, just takes in that horizontal scattering or choose an azimuthal range which just takes in a kind of a wedge in that vertical. Um, now, the DAT files that you're outputting for these two things, you probably wouldn't be going on to use those for modeling because, uh, and by modeling, I mean the kind of dummy atom modeling or atomistic modeling that we tend to, to think about in structural biology. Um, and the reason is, it kind of doesn't make a lot of sense. You know, if you're uh, getting scattering from the, the sort of long axis of a fiber or scattering from the short axis of a fiber, uh, what is the model going to look like? Um, you know, you're not going to get anything that has a kind of a, a, a atomistic meaning to it. Okay, but what you might want to do is um, uh, quantify how anisotropic is my scattering and relate that to the fact that you do have this kind of elongated fiber or such. Um, or you might want to get a radius of duration or something that, that relates to the long axis of a molecule um, or a radius of duration that relates to the short axis. So you would have to define in your head exactly what kind of information you want to get out of this kind of analysis. Okay. So anyway, how do we go about doing that? Um, uh, and there's other answers to this question. Inside Dawn, uh, there's um, these, uh, let's see if I can find one. Um, uh, yeah, so inside Dawn, you've got these profile tools. You can choose the azimuthal profile. That'll actually uh, allow you to sort of draw out a wedge um, on your raw data and, and do some analysis with it. Um, so there's there's kind of uh, ways of doing this that give you a bit more control and a bit more options, okay? But that, I'm just going to show you a very quick and dirty way that we can do it here, okay? So if we um, imagine that our beam center is, is kind of round about here, let me just uh, do... Histogram and zoom out again. Okay, so we can kind of see now where our beam center is. So our beam center is here. Um, as we move from the beam center to the right in the edge, that angle there is zero degrees. Okay, and then we're going to come round and going vertically down from the beam center to the bottom of the detector, that is 90 degrees. Coming from the beam center to the left of the detector, that's going to be 180 degrees, and then going straight up is 270 degrees, okay? So in our azimuthal range here, what we could do is we could say, I just want an azimuthal range, let's say, from 80 degrees to 100 degrees, okay? So I've typed 80, 100, and I'm going to hit return, okay? Um, and then if I click on the azimuthal integration step again, it's going to recalculate only using that portion of the curve. 
Um, you can see here uh, I've got, um, I'm going to use this as kind of box zoom thing to just zoom in on this little region. You see here we've got a signal coming along and then suddenly we get nothing and then it comes back up again. This would be a module boundary. So because we've selected a 20 degree range from 80 degrees, which is kind of, you know, here to 100 degrees, so 10 degrees on either side of 90, that's a kind of a vertical wedge here. We've actually got, not measured any pixels within the Q bins where these module boundaries are, so it's just showing them as zeros, okay? Um, I hope that makes sense. Uh, and we go out to the edge of the plate. I'll oh, just, uh, incidentally, while you're on this output, um, if, if I hit the letter Y, I move to a log scale on the y-axis, so that just helps us to see this a little bit better. Uh, I could do the same on x, so if I do x, we now have an x sca uh, log scale on the x-axis. If I hit it again, we go back to linear. Cool tip. Um, okay, so you can see now we've, we've just chosen that region. So what I could do is uh, process this through to the text files. Um, now I've got my vertical wedge. Uh, I could then choose, uh, let's say, you know, from sort of 260 to 280. Um, that would give me a, another file uh, related to this kind of region of the detector here. Obviously, you can kind of pick your angles and things. Um, uh, you might want to change the radial range to sort of clip it where the edge of the plate is, etc. You get the point. So this would allow you to reprocess your data in different sort of azimuthal ranges. Okay, so I hope that makes sense um, and thank you for listening.